jumping right into this, uh, where we're at in Mark chapter 9, I've got a question for you. So, or actually, it, it's more of a statement from me, and then to ask yourself, have you ever witnessed coming down from the top of the mountain and then experiencing a time, you know, while you were up on that mountain, so to speak, this could be a, you know, kind of a, a real mountain top experience or just a, a time that you had a refreshing from the Lord. It could have been during worship at a church or it could have been at, at, at a wedding or it could have been in the middle of the night that God refreshed your soul and that you had just a wonderful uh, experience or an encounter with God. And, and uh, I liken it to like, I remember uh, going hunting uh, when I was an adult and I used to go hunting with my father. But one time I went up and um, I was with another brother and it was so beautiful up there. The sky was crisp and rain would fall. Just, just a beautiful, beautiful visual experience. And the air was cleaner. The air was fresher. And, uh, and then it was time to go home. And the realization of being home was, you know, you come down from the Sierras and you come down into the, you know, kind of the foothills. And then you come down around um, like Highway 20 and and then all of a sudden you're on that top and you look down in the valley and you just see this, it almost looks like smoggy. Yeah, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm home. This is, this is my real home, Yuba City. And, um, and then when you get home, you know, that all the trouble that you have escaped possibly by just being outside in the outdoors or whatever might even present itself when you get home, troubled children. Uh, that relationship that you may have escaped just for a little while was, was kind of uh, on pause. And then the reality comes of going right back into where you left. And that's what it's like to go from the mountaintop into the valley. I imagine those that are going skiing when there is snow and it's so beautiful and white, crisp, whatever. You're up there having a good time and you come back down and pretty soon there's no snow. There's a little bit and then you get down into the valley again where there has been no rain and you're like, I'm home. Well, where we're at in Scripture this morning is a lot like that. Last week, the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus took three of his disciples up the hill. They reached the pinnacle, if you will, of an experience that they personally had with Jesus, a, an amazing encounter with Jesus as he displayed his divinity and as God spoke to him and said he was well pleased. And it was a beautiful, beautiful mountaintop experience for all of those that were there, including Christ. And so now we pick up the story as they come back down that hill. They descend back down that hill to Capernaum. And when they get to the bottom of that hill, this is what they will encounter. They will encounter discontentment. They will encounter uh, disbelief. They will encounter a dispute, and then they will encounter despair, and then they will encounter desperation, and then eventually they will encounter Jesus again. And it's often like our experiences in life is that just when we think that things are going as well as they possibly can, from out of nowhere comes trouble. And all of us, and when we hit times of trouble, when we hit times of despair, confusion, uh, disagreement, uh, whatever those D words are, we normally, as our first reaction, don't go to faith or prayer. We try to heap the trouble upon ourselves, and then we become overwhelmed, all right? This is what's happening as they come down that mountain. I'll pick it up in Mark chapter 9, verse 14. Um, they came down the mountain, and when they, came, uh, when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and scribes arguing with them. And immediately, so there's the dispute, they came down the mountain, they saw a great crowd around them being the other disciples that were left behind, and then there were scribes there, just, you know, we're kind of doing this inductively, so just remember who's in this picture, right? So the disciples and Jesus coming down the hill, there's a great crowd over there. Inside the crowd are the rest of the disciples and scribes, and they're having an argument. First thing they see when they come down the mountain. And immediately, 
All the crowd, when they saw him, they were greatly amazed and they ran up and greeted him. So all the crowd were super excited because there was Jesus coming down the mountain and they just greeted him and they ran to him. And then he asked them, Jesus says, what are you arguing about? What are you disputing about? And someone from the crowd answered him and said, teacher, I brought my son to you for he has a spirit that makes him mute. He can't talk. It's my son. So there's another man who enters the scene. He has a son. He has a bad spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and he grinds his teeth and he becomes rigid. What a graphic picture of the condition of this man's son. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. They were not able. And he answered them, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. So Jesus appears to be like, like Henri. He kind of he, he has trouble here, right? And so you're like, wait, wait a minute, Jesus, this, this man, he's pleading with you to help him and help his son. And then you, you kind of address this generation and you say something that I think we all need to hear, that it's a faithless generation. You faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you or to suffer with you? How long am I to be, keep carrying, carrying you through these troubles? How often? Now, I want to just say something here that this is an act of mercy. This is an act of the grace of God to point out to this generation and to those in that crowd and to those listening about this scripture, these scriptures right here, it's God's grace when he says, no faith, no faith. And he's going to go through this whole, this whole picture or this story here that is being told to us, it's a true story, and he's going to end it with kind of a personal rebuke or a personal form of grace to his disciples and to us. And hopefully by the grace of God, we could take away some parts and pieces of this and apply it to our own lives this morning. So let's just continue. Bring him to me, Jesus says. Bring the boy to me. And they brought the boy to him, verse 20. And when the spirit saw him, interesting, the spirit in this boy saw Jesus Immediately, it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground, and he rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Interesting, the boy was just the boy who had this spirit, but the minute that the boy approached Jesus, the spirit in the boy, the foul spirit, tried to go into hyperdrive to protect himself from Jesus. And then Jesus asked another question, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. Now, just for a moment, to try to enter into some compassion for this man, imagine this, this boy, we don't know how old the boy is, but from childhood, a long period of time, this man, son, has been, this, has been troubled with this demon, the spirit. Imagine the countless hours of wondering if this is ever going to stop or the division that it may have caused. I mean, oftentimes when there's trouble in the house, you, want to, you know what it's like, husbands and wives, you got trouble in the house, you might have division yourself. I know what this is like personally. I won't go into that this morning, but I know personally what this is like when something seizes your child and you just have no way, you just have no way of fixing it. From childhood, it's often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. I mean, imagine this, 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 this young boy is being seized by this spirit, wanting to take the boy's life. But if you can do anything, if you can do anything, remember what he says, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Notice that it's not just the boy that's troubled, it's the father. No, no, no father 
can truly go into denial when one of his sons or daughters is in trouble. It affects both. And so, Jesus again, again, seems to be a little ornery in his response. Why is his response this with an explanation mark? If you can, right? If you can, did you really say to the, to the creator of heaven and earth, if you can? Remember the leper, if you will? Yes, I'm willing. But to this man, if you can? Just, just think about that a minute. If you can. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. All things are possible for one who believes. And so again, this, this act of almost a little slight rebuke here is on purpose because he gets their attention, right? He gets their attention that there's, there's something missing, this faithless, faithlessness and faith in believing in who he is. He just come off that mountain. Now, they didn't see that. Only three of his disciples did. But Jesus knows who he is. He knows he's God. And he's trying ever so patiently to, to, to teach this to his disciples and to teach this to those who listen by displaying through his teaching or even his acts of miraculous acts that, that this is not just an ordinary prophet, but this is God himself. Have faith in me. Can you trust me? Right? And so um, immediately the father of the child cried out and said this, I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe, but help my unbelief. And I don't know if anyone in here ever struggles with, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. But, but obviously at times, whether we say we don't believe or whether we say we're, we're struggling with our belief, it transacts in the way we act. It transacts in the way we pray. It transacts in the way we hold back forgiveness. Unbelief transacts itself in all sorts of evils and unnecessary problems. And Jesus is saying, please, you faithless generation, don't you know who your faith is in? It's not just this man named Jesus. It's God himself. It's God himself. And I know that sometimes when I pray, my focus is on faith, yeah, but my, my focus is more on this this insurmountable problem that's existing and more on that than the person that I'm praying to. If I could just raise up, if I could just, just, just you know, kind of extinguish the unbelief and remember that the person that I'm praying to is the creator of heaven and earth. He's a creator. Oh, wait, 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 wait. No, no, this is God. This is God. And all of a sudden, this, this heavy burden that's over here that has been on my shoulder is now being, being removed, if you will. The mountain's starting to come down as faith arises and is placed on the Savior. And so how often is he going to have to bear up our lack of faith? How many times do we have to be reminded, have you prayed yet? Have you talked to God yet? Have you believed yet? Or are we walking around in unbelief? We know that uh, it is through, through faith by grace that we're saved. We, we got that kind of down. I'm saved. I'm saved by faith. I'm saved by faith. But do we have faith, you know, not only in him, but faith for him to carry out what we're praying for or what we need? And so he's... He's, I believe in, in all of this story, we are getting to see Jesus' heart for us to have faith, to have belief. And then he's going to teach his disciples one more little truth here. And the Father is just like us. And maybe those of us this morning that are walking around in some unbelief need to be just like the Father, even if we don't have a little boy at home that has an insurmountable problem. Lord, I, I'm struggling I believe you, but help my unbelief. What a great way to cry out like this man did. And Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, and he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf, 
you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never in, enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse so that most of them thought that he's dead. He's just dead now. But Jesus took him by the hand. I just love this. I love it when Jesus touches people. He took him by the hand, he lifted him up, and he arose. Wow. So what they could not do, Jesus did. But he didn't say, I'm the only one that can do this. He said, all things are possible. All things are possible. Not mandate that all things will happen as you ask them. But you are praying to a God who all things are possible for him to do. All right, so after crying out, both him and came out. And then when they, then, you know, he, he touched him, he lifted him up and he arose. And then the next thing that happens is the disciples apparently leave from there and they enter into a house. Now it's just him and his 12. The crowd's gone, the boy's gone, the dad's gone. I don't know what the dad's doing, but my guess is, my guess is he's having a beautiful conversation with his mute son. Now I'm going to come back to that muted son because that muted son was touched by Jesus himself. And I'm going to ask a question, remind me if I forget to come back and ask a question about you as it relates to this boy. All right. Now, so then they went into the house and his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. This, this, this is not going to happen without prayer. This is not going to happen without having a conversation to me and the Father. This is not going to happen. You're not going to transact any power to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil without faith. And I'm going to tell you that when you pray, when you pray to God, right? When you, listen, this is very important. When you pray to God, you are exercising your faith muscle. Now, I'm going to ask those, I know this because I know people, and I know, I know people that, uh, that operate in a really good place when it comes to prayer and faith. Now, trust me, they are connected. And this story is connected. You faithless generation, you come back to the disciples, how come we couldn't do it? You didn't pray. You didn't pray. And how many of us... How many of us, like me, I grew up like this, you know, my, my prayer life was sitting at the dinner table. I've said this a lot. If you've never heard this before, then enjoy it or laugh at it. Do whatever you want. It's the truth. If you've heard this before, just be patient with me. But we would sit at the kitchen table. My mom is listening, so I have to tell the truth. We sat at the kitchen table and we'd pray this prayer, right? God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. By his hands we all are fed. Give us, Lord, our daily bread. Every meal. But there was no faith connected to it. There was no understanding connected to it. There was no spirit connected to it, especially for me. Because I heard goddess great. I'm thinking it's like goddess, like a goddess. Not God is great, but goddess great. Lettuce is, we always had salad. Lettuce was the lettuce in front of my plate. I'm not kidding. This is true story. This is where I love to hate ranch, right there at the dinner table with no, no ranch on that plate. Let us thank him. My dad's right there. Let us thank him for this food. By his hands, we all are fed. Give us Lord. I don't know what Lord was. Our daily bread. We had bread. I'm trying not to eat bread right now. Give us Lord our daily bread. By his hands, we all are fed. It was a repetitious prayer, although it was a prayer. It wasn't connected to faith. It wasn't connected by the Holy Spirit to anything. And then we go to bed at night. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep it. If I should die before I wake, that's all I ever heard. If I'm going to die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And I didn't know what that meant. 
every night. So people can pray, but you could pray without faith or you could pray without belief. You could pray without knowing or you could pray to you know, the sky. But no, Jesus is trying to reveal himself all the way through the book of Mark that, hey, I'm God. I'm God came from heaven in the flesh. I'm standing in your place, but I'm fully God. And he's telling his disciples, listen, if you want power, you want, you, want, you want to exercise authority that I've given to you, then believe on him whom he sent. When you're praying, you're praying to the God of the universe. You're not praying to an empty sky. You're not praying to some for an object, the object of your faith is your creator. The object of your faith is your savior. The object is your faith is the one that pulled you from the pit to begin with. And so he's saying, hey, I'm gonna just rebuke you right now. You, 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 you gotta ramp up your faith in your prayers. Now listen, I, I, I was reading a book or, or an excerpt from a book by Sinclair Ferguson, which is an amazing pastor for many, many years, and they wanted him to write a book on prayer. And you know what he said? He goes, you need to find someone else more suited for this because I am always convicted about my prayer life. This is an amazing man of God. And they told Sinclair Ferguson, we've asked four other amazing men of God, and they all said the same thing, ask another person. So we can all be convicted of not praying enough. That's not what this message is about. This message is not about pray more, have more faith. This message is to believe more, to trust more, to understand that when you hit a hard place in your life, you don't have to lean on your own understanding. You don't have to have the cares and the weights of the world just oppress you when you have your Savior standing by at the rescue How many of you heard this song? Um, I, I can't remember. The, oh, uh, I think it's called, Oh, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. But here's an excerpt from that. It was written by a preacher named Joseph Scriven in 1855. He wrote it to his mother because his mother was severely missing him. She was in England. He was in Canada. And he wrote this, this, uh, this famous hymn started out as a poem, but look at this little piece here. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Needless pain, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. I can go through this scriptures here, countless times where men, good men like Joshua, failed to inquire of the Lord before he set out in battle. And it cost men in his group or his team their lives because a leader did not inquire of God as to how many men they should take in battle. Prayer is such a, such a wonderful tool because it connects us, it connects our faith to God, it connects God to us. Prayer is such an awesome opportunity to have a dialogue or to have a conversation with God, thereby building relationship with God. Prayer increases your faith muscle. I said that once, and I'm, I'm going to just say it a few times. So ask yourself this morning, how much faith do you have? And then go over here and say, how often do I exercise it in prayer? You see, my wife, you know, I'm, I'm going to raise her up just to elevate her just a little bit. Not her, but her faith. Ten years, I put her through horrible times. But she kept trusting and kept believing and kept praying. And no, she put it on her own for many years. She'll tell people, I, I, I tried to fix them. I tried to change them. I tried to do this. I tried to do that. I did everything until I finally said, God, I'm done with him. You can have him. Her exact words. And then she began to pray. Really for someone that she loved, but someone that was kind of her enemy. Anybody here have a little bit of hatred towards someone because of what they did or what they said or how they carried themselves out? You know what Jesus says to, 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 for us to do about that? Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them. 
pray for them. Why? It exercises your faith that you believe that God can do something greater than you could do in your own vengeance or in your own frustration, that God has something greater for that person and that I could pray that they might be blessed. Pray for those that despitefully use you, he says. Pray. Depend upon God, not yourself. See, oftentimes like this, like this man, the circumstances that were surrounding his life and now the disciples, they're just in despair. They're, they can't get it fixed. They can't do it, right? Oftentimes, this is important, oftentimes through trouble, your faith will actually wane. Oftentimes through hard times, your faith will actually go dim, But it's in the same time that your faith goes dim that all of a sudden you are reminded that maybe God can help. And you begin to pray. And then all of a sudden prayer and faith start to connect, start to connect. And then you start to see hope. You start to have hope rise up. And you start to see God in the details of the day. Like, you know what? He is listening. And guess what, guys? If you're praying for someone that is super sick, and you're praying for someone and you don't see the results of it, just ask yourself this, have I gotten closer to God? Has my faith increased through this trial? And and, and, and I'm just going to tell you like, like it is, okay, is that the reason why Jesus was displeased with the crowd, displeased with the Father, and displeased with the, the disciples was because they didn't have faith. In God. Without faith, you guys know this verse. You know this verse. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's impossible. Let's take a look at the scripture where that's found. If you could, Stephanie, please turn to this scripture here. Uh, Hebrews 11.3. And then we'll go from Hebrews 11.3 to Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.3 says this, by faith, okay, listen, this is important. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. By trusting in God and what he said happened, we believe that the whole world, the whole universe was created by the word of God. That's faith, that we believe that. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So what is seen by the heavens, the heavens declare the wonderful works of God. We look at the heavens and they declare that that, that God made them. And the thing in the middle between God made them and the stars is our faith. I believe that you created the heavens and the earth. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And look at verse six. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. Oh, look at this, the connection here. He must believe that he exists and that he rewards the person that diligently seeks him. What does diligently seek him look like? God, I believe, but, but help me in my unbelief. I, I'm coming, I believe you exist, but I, but I want to believe more. Lord, I, I, I have trouble over here and I'm, I've been trying to pack it upon myself. I've been trying to do it myself. Lord, speak to me. Hey, Bob, did you pray about it? No. The maker of heaven and earth is here. Where does my help come from? According to scripture, the maker of heaven and earth. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I could shift my attention from my trouble onto the maker and the creator of heaven and earth. Maybe I ought to talk to him. Maybe he would listen. Maybe he would help. Maybe I can't do it because I was never made to do it. I was never created to overcome trials and tribulations. I was created to walk it out with my savior in a conversation called prayer and called trust. I will tell you that after I broke trust in my relationship, After 10 years of coming out of that and walking in a manner worthy of my calling, the greatest thing in the world to hear from my wife is when I walk out the door and my wife says, hey, Bob, I don't know why I'm knocking. I'm walking out the door. I'm not knocking. (laughs) Bye, honey. Just want you to know I trust you. Now, listen, I don't know God but I know God's heart. And I feel like if I could say that, this may not be theologically correct, 
But I believe God is also pleased when we trust him because his word says he does. Like, I, I, I can't really see the, the, the forest of the trees here, God, but I trust you. That's my son. This, I, this situation over here is overwhelming me, but I trust you. I got you. Just walk it out. Just walk towards it. Don't shrink back from your faith. Don't shrink back from your, from your trouble. Just, just exercise prayer and faith, and, 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 and then I'll walk you right through it. Now, I wanna, do you want to please God? Trust him. Have faith. How do, you, how do you exercise faith? Through prayer. Now listen, my old pastor, Pastor Bob from, I used to love it when people said, hey, I'm praying for my Pastor Bob, right? After I became a pastor, I'm thinking, good, you're praying for two Pastor Bobs that I know, right? I'm praying for Pastor Bob. Spurgeon says, there's nothing more kind than you can do than to pray for me. There's nothing more absolute that you can do than to pray for me. But my Pastor Bob really helped me one time. He said, listen, when you pray, do you pray in your head? Like, I'm thinking about this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And all of a sudden you're thinking about a cheeseburger, you know, or, or something will walk in front of you and you're not praying anymore because you're praying in your head. So he told me, he goes, when you're in your truck or you're by yourself or you want to pray, pray out loud because you, 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 you will stay on task. You, you will stay focused and, and, and you'll hear what you're saying. And then if someone ever asks you to pray, like in a meeting, you, you, you've heard yourself pray already and you don't, it's Okay. I'm like, wow, that's good information. One day I was driving to work one day and I'm just praying out loud, just going to town and I pull up to a red light and the guy's looking at me like I'm crazy. So I grab my cell phone and I put it back up here like I'm praying like I'm talking. (laughs) Seriously, it's the best advice I've ever been given. Pray out loud. Pray scripture. And believe. And believe. Imagine that. Believe that he could do far greater, more than you could ever ask or think. Believe. He's God. And then, I love this. I just love this this passage that's found in um, Hebrews 10. This comes on the tail end of, of the church going through great trouble. And they had just said this statement. I remember preaching this one other time. They had just said that, that they thought it was great that their houses were plundered. And Rob, think about what's happening in Ukraine. I wonder if there's Christians there that are saying what was said in Hebrews. He said, they, 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 you remember that confidence that you had? He said, remember that confidence you had? Even when your houses were plundered, you stayed in faith because you knew you had something far greater awaiting you. And then just beyond that, it says this in that same passage. You can go back and read the rest. But in 1035, it says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence. Don't throw away that assurance, which has a great reward. Don't throw it away. That same reward that you have when you first believed, don't throw that away. Don't throw that assurance away. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised for yet a little while, And the coming one will come and he will not delay. And it's by faith that we believe that he's coming back. But my righteous one shall live by faith. The one that is in right standing with me has right standing with me because of faith and he lives by faith, right? He lives by faith, he walks by faith. But if he shrinks back, I hate to say this, you guys, but we need to hear it. But if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. If he shrinks back from what? From faith, from trusting. So right now, I believe that everybody in this room possibly has somewhere in their life that they really need to trust him. And some of those are like that boy that has been muted And you need Jesus this morning to deliver you from a lack of faith and a lack of prayer. So that those those mouths would be unmuted and faith would spring up. 
and sorrows would be lessened, evils would be lessened. Not too many people I know that could, that could pray to God and like ask him for deliverance or ask him for something like, like right now. And if he stays in that attitude of prayer over and over and over, he, he has less likely of a chance to falling greatly. But the ones that are muted, they're liable to convulse. They're liable to be swallowed up in their own despair, in their own trouble, in their own sorrow. And we need to hear this morning, faithless generation, there are no what ifs with me. There are no what ifs with God. All things are possible for them who believe. All things. I want to read you something. I want to tell you, I've said this before, but, you know, uh, Colby's dad is, Colby's here, I think I saw Colby. His dad, uh, he would attest. His dad is probably the most godly man I know. I'm just going to be honest. He, he's like a saint. He's, he, he's got an incredible gift of encouragement. And uh, he stood up in front of a craftsman meeting one day, and he goes, I want to confess to everybody he said, that man, Bob Oots, he goes, he was the most unlikely person to ever be a Christian. We played sports together for years, little league in college. And then he said, there's no way, no how that he would ever be a pastor. And then I go back to my wife's prayers. Then I go back to my mother's prayers. Then I go back to my grandmother's prayers. And probably the prayers of midnight with my two boys in the room wondering if dad is ever gonna be okay. Number one, don't give up on people. Keep praying. Listen to what Spurgeon says about this. I just, I haven't had a Spurgeon quote in a long time. It's way overdue, so this is a long one. Until the gate of hell is shut upon a man, we must not cease to pray for him. And if we see him hugging the very doorpost of damnation, then we must go to the mercy seat and beseech the arm of grace to pluck him from his dangerous position. While there is life, there is hope. And although the soul is almost smothered with despair, we must not despair for it, but rather arouse ourselves to awaken the almighty arm of God by faith and prayer. Don't get despair like this man whose son was just a mess. But take that despair to prayer and exercise your faith in the one who created the heavens and the earth. I'm just going to walk back as the ushers and musicians are coming forward to, we walk, we'll, we'll go and have a meal together, communion, <clears throat> where we've been. I don't often do this, but I feel like I need to do this this morning. You can expect evil to present itself after times of refreshing you could expect the resistance from Satan himself when you make advances in the kingdom. We almost have to expect it. You almost have to know that it's lurking around the corner. But what defends ourselves is prayer and faith. Hold up the shield of faith, extinguishing the fiery darts of the devil. So remember that. The next thing is to remember this morning, through the word, Jesus rebuked his disciples, he rebuked the crowd, he rebuked the scribes for their lack of faith. And then he personally told the disciples, the problem was you didn't pray. And his grace is what exposes it. Great, uh, great difficulties or great trials will often weaken your faith, but it's a doorway to prayer which increases your faith. And many of us, forfeit the opportunity to pray because we are trying to carry it out ourselves. We're trying to go back somewhere that we used to be able to do it on our own instead of 
humbling ourselves, coming to the Father and say, I can't do it. And there's others that um, really need to pray for those that despitefully use you. You really need to pray for those that that maybe, maybe have disappointed or hurt because Jesus asks us to pray for them too. And finally, I'm gonna say this. If you're a mother, if you're a grandmother, if you're a little boy, don't ever stop praying for your loved ones. Don't ever stop praying. Until the gates of hell close, don't ever stop praying. You know, this morning, there's been a ton, I would say not a ton, there's been a bit of resistance. I mean, I thought Mike wanted to go up and drum this morning. (laughs) There was a car parked over there, had to interrupt worship. When I sent Stephanie the scriptures, I sent her Mark 8 instead of Mark 9. I could go on and on and on. It's one of the few times I've walked up here with a lump in my throat. Grace, they're all grace. It's all grace. But it is also our adversary trying to get us distracted from something really important to pray with faith. The night before the crucifixion, our Lord, our Savior, went and prayed. He was tempted to ask God. He, didn't, he wasn't tempted. He asked God if there was any other way to take it away. Then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. What a beautiful prayer that is. And because God answered that prayer, we take communion this morning because he went all the way to the cross How long, he said, must I suffer? Well, he did, all the way to the cross. And when he came up out of the grave, which which Pastor Craig was talking about, the resurrection, he justified himself as God. And by faith, we are justified. We are given forgiveness of sin. We are given adoption as sons and daughters. And even if we were born deaf or mute, we have the ability to pray. And God gives us the faith to pray. And right now, whatever is going on in your life is his grace to give you another opportunity to pray and to believe. I've got a lot. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness of sin and the gentle reminder, the gentle rebuke this morning that you gave your church. We thank you. We thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, the perfect atonement for our sin. We thank you, Lord, for the divine relationship you had with the Son and the Holy Spirit and how they come together this morning through your word to teach us and to direct us and to remind us once again that you stood in our place, that you took our sin upon yourself, you died a criminal's death, 
And then you, Father, said it pleased you to crush him, knowing that from him many would be made righteous. And so for those of us that have been made righteous by faith this morning, we gratefully celebrate this meal together. Let's eat and drink together.